still in progress, in which we're using uh, Raman spectroscopy. And uh, here I've taken the liberty of uh, expanding the scope of the uh, conference uh, uh, to include uh, other types of vibrational spectroscopy, including Raman spectroscopy, uh, on uh, methane oxidative coupling catalyst. As most of you probably realize, in our laboratory, we uh, have a, a program uh, which we're attempting to uh, convert uh, methane principally to uh, chemicals. And uh, one of the important reactions, which I'll show in the next overhead, is the conversion of methane to ethane and ethylene through a process known as oxidative coupling. Uh, at the outset, I want to acknowledge uh, several individuals, uh, particularly Xu Ming Yang, who uh, was in my group until very recently and presently in the uh, Bethlehem, uh, Pennsylvania area. Uh, and she is the uh, person who has done uh, most of the experimental work that I'll be talking about today. Uh, the actual Raman apparatus is in the laboratory of Professor Jan Lani, and uh, so he has uh, graciously consented to uh, collaborate with us, although he's principally a, uh, a gas phase uh, spectroscopist. Uh, he has had interest in recently in looking at solids and particularly catalysts along with our group. I would also like to uh, acknowledge uh, Helmut Knutzinger, who many of you know, along with his uh, recent graduate student, now PhD, Gerhard Mestel, who uh, uh, were very gracious to me when I was uh, uh, visiting at the University of Munich uh, as a uh, uh, visiting professor there. And uh, uh, also uh, Dr. Holler, who uh, has uh, continued to work on, on uh, the barium peroxide, which I'll be discussing in a moment. I thought uh, just by way of introduction, it would be well to tell you a little bit about uh, oxidative coupling uh, catalysts, and particularly uh, four that we're going to be looking about looking at today. Uh, and uh, uh, first of all, though, uh, I've indicated here the oxidative the uh, oxidative coupling reaction, where uh, one takes uh, methane and oxygen, reacts it, and the desired products are. Uh, ethane, ethylene, and at the same time one obtains a certain amount of carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, water, and hydrogen. And of course uh, ethylene is the target molecule, but uh, at any reasonable level of conversions, uh, carbon dioxide and a small amount of carbon monoxide are also formed. Uh, one of the, the goals, of course, is to achieve high conversion and selectivity. But uh, given the trade-off, it's better to achieve high selectivity and moderate levels of conversion. And uh, typical values that have been achieved at the present are 20% uh, conversion with something like 80% C2 selectivity. Uh, by C2, we mean combined ethane and ethylene selectivity. And uh, uh, these are uh, four of the uh, better catalysts that are known uh, at the present time, uh, we have been involved with the barium magnesium oxide catalyst, uh, a, a very interesting catalyst that uh, I'll be talking about more and that the Raman has provided a, a lot of insight into is the sodium tungstate on cerium oxide. And uh, that is a, an interesting system because cerium oxide itself is a very non-selective uh, catalyst for the oxidation of methane. It takes methane almost exclusively to carbon dioxide and water. And yet when the cerium oxide is modified by various materials, and one of the most favorable ones being uh, sodium tungstate, then it becomes a reasonably good oxidative coupling catalyst. Another catalyst uh, which is somewhat related to the uh, ARCO catalyst that was uh, uh, introduced about a decade or so ago uh, involves uh, manganese, uh, magnesium oxide, and as well sodium tungstate. And uh, we'll be making some comments on that uh, and uh, talking about the Raman spectra of that. And then finally, our old friend, uh, the lithium mag oxide catalyst. Uh, 
these catalysts really will break down into two general types. The first and the fourth are strong basic oxides. And uh, the uh, second and third tend not to function in, as a result of being uh, these, uh, these basic oxides. They contain uh, transition metal ions and, and uh, probably the mechanism for the activation of methane and even the active center on the middle two catalysts is probably different from the first and the last catalyst. Uh, the other point that I would make while I have this overhead uh, on, and we'll return to it many times, that is the temperatures at which these reactions are carried out. All of them are carried out at high temperatures by normal catalytic uh, standards. Uh, the the uh, lithium mag oxide is carried out, at, uh, the reaction is carried out over that at uh, uh, by these standards, relatively milder conditions, about uh, 675 C. But the other catalysts work uh, best at uh, considerably higher temperatures, around 800 degrees for these two catalysts, and in excess of 800 degrees for the barium on magnesium oxide. So these are catalysts which operate at high temperatures, and uh, one of the uh, points that I want to uh, stress in this talk is the applicability of Raman spectroscopy to deal with and to make in situ measurements at these very high temperatures. And uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, I think no other type of spectroscopy uh, could uh, function at these temperatures and enable one to carry out in situ experiments on catalytic samples. And so in this sense, uh, Raman is a, a very powerful technique. Uh, Raman spectroscopy is a very powerful technique for examining uh, catalysts which operate under extremely high uh, temperatures. The uh, cell which we have developed uh, for uh, carrying out these studies is shown here. Uh, it uh, involves uh, two windows, uh, one in which the uh, laser light is introduced and another in which the scattered light exits into the spectrometer. Uh, the catalyst is in a small holder here, simply pressed in. This is a quart, all quartz cell, fused quartz cell. Uh, and the surface, uh, effective surface of the catalyst is at a 45 degree angle, so the light enters and then scattered uh, 90 degrees. Uh, there's a thermocouple immediately below the catalyst, so with uh, reasonable accuracy we can determine the, uh, the temperature in the region of the catalyst. Uh, and the sample is also amenable to flow of gases. Uh, gases come in here, flow over the catalyst sample, and then uh, out uh, the exit. So uh, the, uh, this uh, cell is capable of operation temperatures up to 850 degrees centigrade, so exceeding the temperatures in which the normal catalytic process is carried out. Now, the uh, first example that I want to talk about is the uh, case of the, the barium uh, on magnesium oxide. And uh, we began to study this in Germany, and it was chosen because uh, we had XPS evidence that indicated that peroxide ions were responsible for the activation of methane. Uh, and peroxide ions uh, are, well, put this way, but barium is one of the, of the most stable uh, peroxides known. So if there were, was a case where uh, a peroxide was involved in catalysis at these elevated temperatures, it would almost certainly occur on barium peroxide. Now, in the XPS experiments, of course, it was necessary to cool the sample and to measure uh, the presence of peroxide ions at ambient conditions, room temperature, and under the vacuum of the XPS instrument, which obviously uh, conditions very far from the catalytic uh, experiment. Nevertheless, with respect to loading of the barium in the magnesium oxide, there was good agreement between the uh, presence of the peroxide ion and the catalytic activity 
of the uh, material. And so we wanted to address such questions as, uh, does the peroxide on uh, peroxide ion on barium uh, magnesium oxide exist at temperatures approaching those used in the catalytic system? Uh, bulk barium peroxide begins to decompose at about 500 degrees centigrade, uh, but it is conceivable that on the surface one could have these very uh, uh, active forms of oxygen. And I should also point out that uh, even before our work, uh, Asuka and co-workers and uh, Krylov and Sinev in, in Russia had shown that even at temperatures around 450 degrees C, uh, peroxide ions, either in the form of barium peroxide or sodium peroxide, were able to activate methane. Not in a catalytic mode, but at least in a stoichiometric mode, and then thus generating C2 products. So uh, we carried out, using the cell that I indicated, uh, studies on uh, samples containing uh, from about 0.5% uh, barium on magnesium oxide, that's mole percent, up to about 15 or 20 mole percent of barium on magnesium oxide. Uh, we obtained the spectra of these samples and uh, we observed a very uh, clear uh, uh, spectrum which is very characteristic of the peroxide. And at room temperature, uh, this band appears at 842 reciprocal centimeters. And this is in good agreement with the published uh, spectrum of barium peroxide and the spectrum which we observed for our pure barium peroxide. Uh, we have also carried out oxygen 18 uh, studies, which I won't report here, and uh, have further demonstrated that uh, this band is consistent with barium peroxide. Now, when one begins to heat the sample up to progressively higher temperatures, uh, the peroxide peak uh, shifts in wave number, and this shift is well known in uh, solid state Raman spectroscopy, and it's due to uh, lattice expansion, contractions, uh, distortions, and uh, sometimes the shifts are to lower wave numbers, sometimes the shifts are to higher wave numbers, but almost always uh, these shifts are, are observed. And again, it's related to the uh, change in the lattice parameters uh, with the temperature. So one observes then a shift in the uh, maximum and as well a broadening, which is not unexpected, and uh, furthermore, a decrease in amplitude. But the point is that even at 800 degrees centigrade, the peroxide ion is still evident and uh, uh, is certainly what could be present under conditions in which uh, the oxidative coupling reaction occurs. Now, I need to tell you one uh, negative side of this, and that is as soon as we introduce methane to the system, we make, of course, some water some carbon dioxide, and since this is a very basic oxide, uh, carbonate ions are formed, and the system is just swamped uh, with a huge uh, carbonate uh, spectrum, which appears at about 1057 or so reciprocal centimeters. And so uh, carbonate ions uh, dominate the surface, and uh, at 800 degrees C, then the uh, amplitude of the uh, peroxide spectrum just blends in with the noise. So in one sense, we're able to obtain an in situ spectrum, that is, in the presence of pure oxygen, uh, we can see the peroxide under uh, conditions in which one would expect oxidative coupling, 800 degrees C. But on the other hand, uh, when methane is introduced, uh, the system the uh, spectrum is dominated uh, by the carbonate ion and the peroxide uh, decreases beyond uh, the, our detection limit. Another <coughs> aspect of the uh, uh, problem was to look at 
the variation in the peroxide signal as we increased the loading. And uh, what we found was that uh, regardless of the temperature at which the spectra were taken, uh, we observed a, a, a sigmoidal uh, shape response uh, with respect to loading. That is, the signal was relatively low at the low loadings, and this is the region that I was showing the previous spectrum. Uh, and then at about 3%, uh, 3, 3 mole percent barium, uh, up to about 6 or 7 mole percent barium, there was a very dramatic increase in the uh, amplitude of the signal, and thereafter, uh, there was a, a much smaller increase with increase in loading. Now, this should be compared with the XPS spectra of peroxide ions, as indicated by the dashed lines, and uh, with the, by XPS, we see uh, a quite different functional behavior. That is, an uh, increase even at the earliest loadings, and then a leveling off at higher loadings. And I think this has to do uh, principally with the sampling depth of the uh, XPS versus the sampling depth of uh, the uh, Raman spectroscopy. Uh, now, as far as I have been able to determine, uh, the question of the sampling depth for Raman spectroscopy for surface species is still uh, rather a cloudy issue. Uh, but it almost certainly is greater, considerably greater, but not infinite not completely through the sample, uh, than is XPS. We know that the XPS sampling depth is, is something like uh, five atomic layers. 90% of the signal will probably come from even the first three atomic layers. So it's what we would call a near surface technique, whereas Raman spectroscopy uh, is able to sample to greater depths. And as we understand this, and the model that we uh, come up with is that at about two mole percent, uh, one has enough uh, barium oxide, barium peroxide to completely cover the surface with a monolayer. And uh, uh, then at higher loadings, uh, we build up multi-layers on the surface and perhaps uh, begin to build up uh, three-dimensional barium peroxide crystals on the surface. In fact, by X-ray diffraction, we can show convincingly that the crystals begin to form. And uh, so uh, as one builds up these multi-layers, the, even though the loading is, continues to increase, the signal from XPS does not increase any further. Whereas with a Raman, apparently as you build up uh, uh, form this monolayer, much of the uh, laser light and the uh, uh, scattered light uh, uh, sample a depth which is gr much greater than the monolayer. So uh, we're really sampling not only the monolayer but much below the monolayer. And then as we begin to build up multi-layers, we're sampling more and more of the barium peroxide and finally, when we build up crystallites of barium peroxide, we're only able to sample a fraction of the peroxide that's present in the crystal. So as the crystals grow, we're only able to sample a fraction of that, and therefore uh, the line, uh, the response again uh, becomes shallow, and uh, there is, is no longer uh, a, a very large increase in the uh, signal with respect to the loading. But uh, uh, as, as far as I'm aware, uh, this sampling depth of the, uh, uh, for the Raman spectrum it needs to be addressed in more detail uh, so that we may have a better understanding of the uh, such phenomena as I've just described. Now I'd like to uh, turn to the second catalyst And the same issue will uh, arise again. Uh, but that is the uh, sodium tungstate on the cerium oxide. Uh, and 
First of all, uh, let's just look at pure sodium tungstate, uh, which has a Raman spectrum at room temperature, it's very sharp. Uh, this has been reported, uh, among other places, in the spectrum by uh, Israel Locks and, and uh, probably predates his work even. Uh, but uh, the uh, assignments are made here. This is the symmetric and asymmetric uh, stretching modes of the uh, sodium tungstate. Uh, and this is sodium tungstate in nearly uh, pure uh, tetrahedral symmetry. Uh, but uh, when we go to the sodium tungstate on cerium oxide in a moment, I'll show you that the, this spectrum is essentially reproduced. Uh, if, however, we look at sodium tungstate uh, with uh, waters of hydration, which modifies somewhat the tetrahedral symmetry, uh, we see, uh, again, characteristic changes in the spectrum. For example, the asymmetric mode, is in, which was one band, is now split into two bands. And uh, incidentally, that should be uh, two waters of hydration rather than one. Uh, and so the Raman spectrum is very sensitive, uh, it's, uh, the tungstate ion is very sensitive to the uh, symmetry around the ion. And uh, that uh, uh, gives us uh, information on what the state of the tungstate ion is on the surface. And this is uh, the samples containing uh, nine mole percent and 28 mole percent sodium tungstate on cerium oxide. Uh, and uh, this spectrum actually was taken at room temperature. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, bands, additional band, which did not appear, of course, in the pure sodium tungstate is due to cerium oxide. So uh, under these conditions, by Raman spectroscopy, uh, we are sampling the cerium oxide. Now that's going to be uh, an interesting point in a moment because we're going to demonstrate by using another technique that uh, the surface is almost certainly covered at least by a monolayer of sodium tungstate. So even though the surface, the exposed surface is sodium tungstate, we have uh, with Raman uh, samples deeper and uh, we observe the cerium oxide uh, present. Uh, the other point that we can make in this spectrum uh, is that the, the uh, bands are almost identical to those which were found in pure sodium tungstate. So we, we have then uh, the tungstate ion in good tetrahedral symmetry, and uh, we also observe by X-ray diffraction the presence of sodium tungstate crystallites. I don't want to make too much about the, uh, uh, the effect of loading here, uh, except to say that uh, when we uh, go up to uh, 28 mole percent sodium tungstate, we see uh, essentially the same amplitude spectrum. And uh, th this point really needs to be studied in more detail, but it appears that uh, much of the additional sodium tungstate is going into the larger crystallites, and in these larger crystallites, we're not sampling any more sodium tungstate than we were at the 9.4 mole percent sample. But again, uh, that's a little bit of a shaky matter, and I, I would, would hate to press that point too far. Uh, one, one other uh, uh, point which is uh, interesting is that we see these bands here at about uh, uh, 1150 uh, reciprocal centimeters, excuse me, 1050 uh, reciprocal centimeters, uh, very small, which could be due to carbonates. But uh, I suppose most obviously we do not see large sodium carbonate signals, which tells us uh, that the sodium tungstate has not decomposed, for example, under pretreatment and oxygen at 800 degrees to form sodium carbonate. So we do not have a, a surface which is largely covered uh, by a sodium carbonate phase and the catalytic activity probably is not associated with that sodium carbonate phase. I, I say that because uh, we had previously studied sodium carbonate on cerium oxide 
and that also is a reasonably good oxidative coupling catalyst. So this, this material uh, apparently does not have an appreciable amount of sodium carbonate, particularly the 9.4 mole percent sample. Well, this is just the uh, spectrum of the pure serine oxide with the uh, single peak at 461 reciprocal centimeter. Right. Now, uh, one of the uh, issues which has uh, uh, arises with this sample and, and is, uh, even was a question with respect to the lithium carbonate uh, magnesium oxide sample, that is, uh, what is the state of the sodium tungstate under operating conditions? Uh, you recall I said that the uh, catalyst was gave good uh, conversions and selectivities at about uh, 782 degrees, just, just round it off and say about 800 degrees C. And uh, we know that bulk sodium tungstate melts at about 700 degrees C. So we have then this layer of uh, sodium tungstate, or at least at lower temperatures, crystallites of sodium tungstate on cerium oxide. Uh, but sodium tungstate melts at about 700, and the catalysis is occurring at something like 800. So what, what is the state of the sodium tungstate? And uh, uh, one of the advantages of Raman spectroscopy is that uh, one can look at the lattice modes and detect melting uh, because there are lattice modes, and particularly sodium tungstate has one at about 90 reciprocal centimeters. And uh, if one melts the sample, then there are no longer any lattice modes. And that's been demonstrated for other materials as well as for sodium tungstate. And <clears throat> so what we did was, uh, since we can carry out Raman spectroscopy at temperatures as high as 800 degrees C, what we did was to measure these lattice modes at high temperatures. And what we find was, what we found was that if we uh, heated the sample to 800 degrees and then cooled it to respect these respective temperatures in, in a random fashion, uh, first of all, at 500 degrees, we do observe the lattice mode. Uh, 600 degrees, the lattice mode is just barely detectable. 620, well, it's almost not there, and by 650 degrees, there is no lattice mode. And that is very, uh, I think, definitive evidence for the fact that the <coughs> sodium tungstate has actually melted on the surface. So what we have is a molten uh, phase of sodium tungstate existing on the cerium oxide. Now, of course, the uh, vibrational modes uh, of the tungstate ion itself will not be so affected uh, by increasing the temperature. And here we find that these modes are essentially present. They decrease somewhat in amplitude and broaden. Uh, but, and in addition, there is, even at 620 degrees, a splitting of this mode at 804 reciprocal centimeters which indicates a lowering of symmetry, which again is consistent with the melting, uh, but nevertheless, we still have the sodium tungstate present. So we have the tungstate ions present, but as we get up to temperatures is, is around 650 degrees, which is even below the bulk melting point of sodium tungstate, uh, the material melts and presumably forms this film on the surface. Now, I would like to give you one other piece of evidence, not from Raman spectroscopy, but from ion scattering spectroscopy, for the presence of this film and for the covering, not, not so much the molten film, but for the, the covering of sodium tungstate on cerium oxide. And uh, ion scattering spectroscopy is strictly a surface sensitive technique. Uh, and <coughs> using ISS, we have been able to detect uh, both cerium ions and tungstate ions using argon ion uh, bombardment of the surface, measuring the, the energy of the 
uh, exiting argon ion. Uh, what we find is, is that we obtain, we, we, uh, ion, argon ion etching occurs, and uh, that as initially, that is after one minute, we observe tungstate ions and a small amount of cerium ions, and as we continue to bombard the sample and etch it, uh, we observe fewer and fewer tungstate ions and more and more cerium ions. And the usual way of treating this data is to <coughs> plot and extrapolate back to uh, zero etching or sputtering time. And what one finds is that the uh, 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 cerium ion signal uh, extrapolates back to about zero at zero time, which indicates that the surface is essentially completely covered with the sodium tungstate. Now again, this was a room temperature experiment, and it was on the nine mole percent sample. At about five mole percent, one would expect complete coverage if there were, was a uniform distribution of the sodium tungstate on the surface. Uh, so uh, this uh, 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 agrees, and I think supports, our model of the um, catalyst, the working catalyst sample in which we have effectively a complete covering of the cerium oxide by the sodium tungstate film. I personally believe that the uh, catalysis is actually taking place on the interface and that the cerium oxide is important. We know that because we've studied so sodium tungstate on other materials and cerium oxide is but it varies depending upon the support. And uh, uh, so I, I think that the cerium oxide is involved, and one can imagine then that the methane and oxygen and the products then diffuse through this thin layer of uh, uh, sodium tungstate, and that the actual catalysis occurs at the interface between the sodium tungstate and the cerium oxide. All right, the, uh, that's. Uh, uh, takes us to the second catalyst, and uh, you've got to have a little extra time, George. <laughs> uh, the third catalyst I want to just briefly mention, and that is the uh, uh, the manganese uh, sodium uh, tungstate magnesium oxide. <clears throat> First of all, uh, in preparation for our interpretation of the actual catalyst. Uh, using literature techniques, we prepared pure samples of uh, MG6MNO8 and have identified them by uh, X-ray diffraction. And as far as I know, this is the first Raman spectrum of that material. Uh, and when we prepare the catalyst, what we observe is uh, a complex spectrum, but uh, consisting of several, I think, identifiable components. Uh, the uh, bands represented by the blue dots are those uh, clearly for the MG6 MNO8. Uh, the bands represented by the red dots are the sodium tungstate. And as one moves up, we're increasing the amount of sodium tungstate in the sample. And the uh, bands represented by the red dots uh, probably are manganese tungstate. Now, we do not have a Raman spectrum of pure manganese tungstate, but we see manganese tungstate uh, by uh, X-ray diffraction in the sample. And uh, uh, this would be consistent with, the spectrum here would be consistent with the uh, slight distortion from tetrahedral symmetry that occurs, for example, in compounds like calcium tungstate. A curious feature, and one which uh, we still do not understand, is that the uh, presence of the sodium tungstate appears to increase the, the uh, degree or the extent of the MG6 MNO8 phase. And uh, that is curious in, in its apparent contradiction with what we observe by X-ray diffraction. Uh, because with X-ray diffraction, we clearly see the MG6MNO8 phase even when no sodium tungstate is present. 
And uh, so that's a, a point that we need to explore in uh, more detail. And finally, I would like to tell you about some very preliminary results on the lithium mag oxide system. And uh, one of the questions that arises as a result of our work on the barium magnesium oxide system is that the peroxide ions also exist on lithium mag oxide. And uh, are they responsible for our catalysis? And <clears throat> there is evidence that peroxide ions do exist, uh, but uh, there is a question as to whether they are very, at least on the lithium mag oxide, but is a question whether they are very reactive uh, with respect to methane. <clears throat> if we take a sample and uh, previously heat it to 750 degrees C briefly, cool it in oxygen, we observe a new band at about 818 reciprocal centimeters, which is totally consistent with peroxides being present on this material. We have not yet carried out the experiment in which we introduce oxygen 18, and that's the critical experiment that needs to be done. Here at about 480 reciprocal centimeters, we see the presence of the evidence for the presence of lithium oxide. Uh, but as we heat the sample in helium and methane, there is very little change in this spectrum. And again, that's at 700 degrees C. And uh, which suggests that if indeed this is peroxide, unless it is somehow buried in the lithium mag oxide material, uh, it is unreactive with methane. And so that was a, a bit of a disappointment to us uh, that this signal did not go away in the presence of methane. So, uh, uh, well, if prolonged periods reacting with methane and oxygen, it does go away. Carbonate signal grows, uh, and the lithium oxide is converted to carbonate. Uh, but the reaction, even at 700 degrees C, which is well above the temperature in which catalysis occurs, is very sluggish. And so, if this is a peroxide, uh, then it is questionable whether uh, it is reactive with uh, methane uh, for one reason or another. Finally, uh, I would like to come back to this question about uh, a molten phase of lithium carbonate on the surface, and uh, we can approach that the same way that we approached the molten sodium tung tungstate question uh, in the previous catalyst. Uh, these are the lattice modes of lithium carbonate, taken for pure lithium carbonate at room temperature. And uh, you can see it has very clear lattice modes, uh, which we can follow as we heat the sample. <clears throat> and in this case, incidentally, lithium carbonate has a melting point of about 723 degrees. <clears throat> in this case, as we begin to heat the sample at progressively higher temperatures, uh, we find that the lines broaden. But even at 700 degrees C, we still see these lattice modes. And it's not until we reach 750 degrees C that they're completely disappear. So our conclusion is, is that uh, unlike the case of sodium tungstate on cerium oxide, under catalytic conditions, lithium carbonate is still a solid, still a crystalline material uh, on magnesium oxide. And so uh, one case you have the melting, and so you have a molten phase. In the other case, you do not have a, mel a melting. And again, uh, I think that Raman spectroscopy is uh, very useful in uh, answering such questions as the state of various uh, supported materials. Well, uh, I hope that I have uh, introduced you uh, to some uh, aspects of Raman spectroscopy that we have found to be very useful in uh, interpreting uh, some of the behavior of these oxidative coupling catalysts. Uh, sometimes one gets answers that uh, one didn't uh, hope or expect, for, expect but uh, nevertheless, uh, I, I think on the barium peroxide, uh, the, uh, the evidence uh, supports but does not prove that uh, peroxides are responsible for the activation of methane. Uh, and uh, I, I think the other key point is that uh, on the sodium tungstate type materials, there seems to be good evidence that the sodium tungstate uh, is present, still as sodium tungstate under catalytic conditions, uh, but 
about it, that is the material is in a molding phase or molding film on the surface of the support. Thank you. Thank you. Well, do we have questions for Jack? Yes. In the first case where you had the barium uh, peroxide species, you showed that as you heated the surface, that the lattice expansion caused a shift to lower frequency right. by 842 wave number mode. Where the other one on the lithium magnesium oxide, there didn't seem to be any of that effect at all. It seemed to be an invariant. Oh, feature. okay, yeah, good, good point. And I, I should have identified that. In the in the case of the lithium mag oxide, those samples were the spectra were actually taken at room temperature. Oh, okay. I see. Uh, so yeah, that, do, do you see the same effect? On yes, the yes. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's large for some samples and some, uh, for some materials, and sometimes it's much smaller. But you will always see some shift uh, as one piece of sample. Yeah. In the RSS spectra, you said that the uh, tungsten covers the, the whole uh, surface. And yet on the R coordinate, there were uh, the signals were by one order point even smaller. It was one ten to the minus four. The other. Uh, yeah. Uh. Mike. Yeah. <laughs> The uh, the actual the actual spectra here. Yeah, there even the, here, the, the, the signal from the tungsten is much smaller than the one from the sodium. Yes, that, well, it is after you have etched it, but uh, uh, before the etching, they're not that much different. But if it then, but if it then should should okay, yeah. Yeah. then the sodium grows so much bigger. Yes, that's right, because you have this tungsten layer, and what you're etching off is the tungsten, and so you have this almost infinite supply of serine monoxide below that. Yeah. Jack, uh, really interesting work, I think, because uh, as we both know, there's a lot of interest in whether uh, one forms a liquid on the surface of these things. Uh, it's particularly interesting to note that you find a difference between the sodium tungstate uh, on the serine monoxide see that difference reflected in any other uh, in any other results for example do you see that difference reflected in uh, the rate of deactivation of or the relative rates of deactivation of those two catalysts well <laughs> the, the catalysts deactivate uh, much differently but I think for different reasons uh, and as you know with the lithium case uh, lithium is continuously being lost to the catalyst and particularly as you approach that melting point. Uh, but the sodium tungstate catalysts are very stable. Even though you have this molten phase there, they're rock stable. Yeah, Norma. Beautiful spectrum, a lovely illustration of the advantage of rather with high temperatures, because you just have a silica cell and it's so much easier than, than, than infrared. But the question you raised about the penetration depth, right. well, of course, it can be considerable in the rock. I should imagine it's simply the penetration depth of the determined by the crystallite size. And by the, sc the scattering light. Yeah. Yes, that, that could well be. Yeah. So it's, uh, it, there may not be a simple answer. It may well <laughs> but be. But it's certainly going to be a lot more than the, than for the XBS. Oh, yes. Oh, right. yes. That, that's very evident. For example, you can, you, you, if you just take barium peroxide out of the bottle and put it in the XPS spectrometer, you see barium carbonate. <laughs> uh, but if you if you do the Raman on it, you see very peroxide. So it's a very different sampling case. Yeah, can you? Uh, you uh, indicated that there is a rather well defined interface between the Syria and the sodium tungsten. Were you looking for any Raman features uh, that would connect the Syria over the tungsten via an oxygen bridge? Neither uh, the tungsten oxide 
Right. Well, we were looking for our un unexplained peaks, unusual phases, and uh, uh, particularly at the nine mole percent level, really there's nothing there that can't be readily explained by just sodium tungstate or serine oxide. No, and no the indication of the, of the, we would call that, 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 that bunch of peaks that, that where the tetrahedral symmetry has been lost there, in that region, right? That, that right, right, right. But I, I, I think that that could, could fairly easily be explained. Now, that, that was on the uh, uh, sodium permanganate, I mean, the uh, sodium tungstate manganese magnesium oxide. But I think, I think that could be readily explained just by manganese tungsten, just by another, yeah. another phase. And I feel rather comfortable with that because we actually see that phase uh, in X-ray diffraction. John? I think you seem a little surprised to get the pre-melting of the sodium tungsten way below its bulk melting temperature. But there are lots of studies now of crystals where when you look at the surface region of the crystal, way below the melting temperature, you see, first of all, lattice vibrations that are very soft, and you mm -hmm. see evidence for disorder in the surface. So probably a small crystal ice will also have a lower melting point, as judged by these techniques, than, yeah. than the melting material. Uh -huh. And I just wanted to ask a question. Is it known for other supported small crystal lights and catalysts that melting does occur below the bulk melting temperature? Is that well known? You know, so uh, well, I, I, as I recall, that uh, Helmut Penitzinger had some evidence, I think, for molybdenum trioxide, or molybdenum oxide species, which uh, you say is the same sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just to address that question, vanadium oxide is a typical example that two vanadium on silver have yeah. a very low temperature, low as melting, bulk melting. Uh, getting to this issue of potentially probing the interaction between the sodium tungstate and the cerium, um, have you looked at the material after it's been cooled down, in other words, to see whether there's any evidence for, for example, cerium doping into the uh, sodium tungstate by you know, diffraction methods or something? If there isn't, so one can make a solid state chemistry argument that you have similar size for cerium and sodium, that there might be some propensity for an interaction there that you can't see at high temperature, but maybe you can you yeah. freeze it out at low temperature and probe it. Yeah, that, that uh, you know, that possibility occurred to us, certainly a, a reasonable one to explain the catalytic properties. Uh, again, we did not see any unique features that we could identify to this, but uh, I, I'm open for suggestions as to, as to how we might do it. In response to a couple of comments, I might say that the, the lowering of the uh, melting point as you decrease the crystal size is, I think, a manifestation of the decalvin equation. It seems to me that people in England have already shown that by taking smaller and smaller particles uh, of the substance. So yeah. your, your results are quite consistent with that. I was going to ask you, <coughs> you had made a comment which was almost an aside, Jack, that you thought that the, if I can try to remember your exact terminology, that the catalysis was occurring at the interface between the, uh, this relates, I think, to Camille's question, uh, the interface between the cerium oxide and the sodium tungstate. Right. Uh, do you have something else you'd like to add to that? Is there, or is that just strictly <laughs> 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 Well, the, uh, no, the, the, the evidence is the following, that we can put sodium tungstate on many different materials number of different laminate oxides, other materials, and uh, uh, one sees a, a wide range of uh, catalytic properties, uh, with the cerium, sodium tungstate, cerium oxide being uh, among the best that we, we've observed, which suggests to me that, that it's uh, the, uh, uh, not just the sodium tungstate that's responsible for the analysis, or uh, maybe a, a better way of putting it is that the uh, substrate has a definite role to play in catalysis. And uh, so it, it suggests that either we're getting the cerium ions going into the sodium tungstate and somehow enhancing the activity there, or uh, that the action is occurring at the inputs. I can't imagine, but maybe this is not what you were thinking about, I can't imagine the methane 
downside, nor can I imagine why that would be particularly advantageous in terms of the CH bond C. Oh, well, I, I don't have any problem with it. It's easy through a, a very thin, uh, maybe uh, five, two, well, actually, actually, on the average, at nine low percent, there are two layers of sodium tungsten. So I have no problem with it using through two layers with a fairly high rate. But can you see any advantage in, in it so doing? Uh, Is serum oxide known as effective? In, uh, well, serum oxide will activate that thing. It, it just it, it, it takes it all the way to CO2. Well, I've heard now I've not had a stand well, up there first. <laughs> I, had a, I had a question and it had to do with uh, if you took sodium tungstate and you put it on a support that didn't seem to have much activity and you seria dope that, do you get the same effect mm -hmm. of putting sodium tungstate on seria? Well, we haven't really done that experiment because I'm not sure you wouldn't wind up with small particles of serum oxide in uh, sodium tungsten. And when you say dope, I assume you mean with something like uh, serum nitrate. Or, but, but anything I can imagine that we dope it with, by the time we pre treated the sample or carried out the catalysis, we would actually make serum oxide. So we would still have uh, the two phase system. <coughs> Yeah, Mike had questions. It's also true, however, that if you simply put sodium tungstate on silica, which has no activity, no sea activity whatsoever, it also winds up having reasonable sea activity, and activity is covered, although it you know, dies very quickly, unlike the cerium oxide. But it does impart considerable sea activity just to plain silica. Whereas if you put it on something like pure lanthanum oxide and some of the others that already have reasonable activity and sea activity, it has almost no effect. The issue of, of what role the support play is still a money. Yeah, to me, we have time. I wonder if the, if the select selectivity will tell you something. If you would decrease the sodium tungstate loading, then you would presumably expose some of the extreme dioxide. And that uh, uh, leads to a lowering of selectivity, which would be kind of proof of the concept. Yes, that yes, well, I heard that. Once you uh, get let's it, say half monolayer, or right. that, that, that lowers the selectivity. Yes, that yes, that's right. You lower the uh, sodium tungstate uh, below. Well, the curve is rather shallow for selectivity decrease, but uh, it decreases below by five whole percent, and selectivity really begins to fall. Yes. So we would need rather proof. What Camille has asked that what the sodium tungstate does is attenuates the complete oxidation. Yeah, that's one way of, of looking at it, that it, it perhaps, well, that's not the whole story. Because, uh, we, we've looked at metal radical formation on serine oxide, and it, it's both a uh, <coughs> core methyl radical former, and it's an ex excellent methyl radical scavenger. So it's not just ethane or ethane, ethylene oxidation that's involved, it's also Another right in the media is a problem. Any further questions? We'll take about a two minute break then.